Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. What a tremendous truth. Jesus is still the answer. You have a question? He's the answer to that question, that problem in life. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thankful for what God's doing here at First Baptist Church. Great to see you here this morning. I wasn't sure if anyone would show up on time, on Time Change Sunday, but you surprised me, and I appreciate that very much. It's great to see Hildy here this morning. Hildy had surgery a couple weeks back. Many of you prayed for me. mentioned that in church. Great to see you this morning. Hildy, glad you're back with us today. Praise God for that. And many folks visiting with us, glad you're here. And hopefully this service will be a blessing to you. If you have your Bibles, open to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. We continue our series. The the title of the series is Fabulous Lessons from the First Three Kings. Now here's the situation. In the Bible, we sometimes think that the Bible doesn't deal with real life problems. My friend, the Bible deals with real life problems. Written parts over 6,000 years ago, the Bible still applies to you and to me today. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. The reason it can do that is because it's the Word of God. It's not just a bunch of old dead men's Word. It's the Word of the living God. And He lives in heaven. He he wrote this Word for us. The Bible is called inspiration, inspired, given by the, the very breath of God. And I'm so thankful for the Bible that applies to you and to me. Sometimes the Bible encourages us. I like being encouraged by the Bible. Sometimes the Bible reproves us and corrects us. I don't like, my flesh doesn't like being corrected by the Bible, but my spirit does. The Bible steps all over our ideas sometimes. Steps all over and and crushes our reactions sometimes. And this morning, this is one of those sermons that the Bible will walk over most of us. You'll see on the screen the word impatience. Impatience. A little phrase, what do they say? Patience is a virtue. But no one can be completely virtuous. Someone said this, the prayer of the modern Christian, Dear Lord, I pray for patience, and I want it right now. Or how about the story of the monk? The story is told about a monk, just a story, who was very, very, very impatient. Well, he knew that as a monk, he could not be impatient, and so he decided to take a sabbatical, and he got away to a little home deep in the woods, far away from civilization, to learn, as the story goes, to be patient. Years and years passed. He's living in the woods all by himself. Fifteen years passed, and a man traveling in the woods happened to come across this little home of this monk who was learning for the last 15 years all by himself to be patient. The man was amazed to find someone living so far from civilization and didn't know the story. So he asked this man, the monk, he said, Sir, why, why are you here? And the monk explained to him, I am learning here, and, and I'm being here, I'm learning to be patient. The traveler asked, Well, sir, how long have you been here? And the monk replied, I've been here 15, 15 years. Stunned, stunned, the traveler asked. He said, well, sir, if you're here all alone, how will you know when you've reached this level of patience? The monk replied, get away from me. I don't have time to talk to you. Patience. 1 Samuel chapter 13, if you have your Bibles open this morning, We'll look through most of the chapters. We kind of understand and unwrap the story here with the king Saul, the first king in the nation of Israel. We're going to learn about his impatience and how impatience always costs us more than we realize. We must learn as Christians to wait on God. Do you ever feel that God's timing is not quite right? You ever feel that God needs to get his watch changed to the proper time because he just doesn't seem to show up when we think he should show up? You ever been praying and it seems, it seems, it appears, it feels like God is just not available right now? And then we get that feeling, well, if God won't answer, then I'll solve the problem. And my friend, this morning, I hope that when we're done this morning, you'll make a commitment to not jump ahead of God this morning. That you'll learn to wait 
and patiently wait, quietly wait on God. God is never late. God is always on time. God doesn't need time. He created time. God knows time, but he operates outside of time, and God is never late. He is always on time. Let's look just at first two verses before we pray this morning. In verse number 8 and 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 13. Verse number 8, the Bible says, And he, speaking of Saul, tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering and the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Lord, I thank you for the time we have today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word. Lord, I ask that now you would help us. Lord, as we look at your word, that you would challenge our hearts, challenge, Lord, our patience and impatience with you. Lord, you're always working, and you're working things out to your honor and to your glory. But, Lord, sometimes we feel, Lord, sometimes it appears that you're running behind schedule. Lord, may we not rush ahead, but, Lord, would you touch us? Would you convict us? Lord, help us to be changed, to be like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for your help this morning. Lord, I ask that there's someone who's here who doesn't know you, never trusted you as their Savior, that today would be the day that they look to you and turn to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Patience and impatience. What a hard lesson. What a tedious lesson. When we want something and we want it right now. In one sense, in one aspect, the odds are stacked against us that we would be patient because we live in an instant society. Everything we expect should be done when we expect it. We live in a fast food society. You go to McDonald's, you go through the drive-thru, you order fries, and you expect them to have fries by the time you get to the window approximately one and a half minutes later. You ever been to the drive-thru and they've asked you to back up or pull ahead so they can reset their timer there? While you sit there and wait and inside you're like, what? You don't have fries? Of all the things at McDonald's, you better have fries. That's what you're known for. That's why you exist on earth to have fries for me when I go through the drive-thru. Or you've ever, have you ever called someone, called a place... And uh, now with, when things were shut down, a lot of orders were, were being picked up. And you, you call some place, and when they answer, they say, can you hold, please? Doesn't that make you happy? Don't you think, wow, you know what? I had nothing to do but sit here listening to your beautiful on-hold music. Thank you for that opportunity. I had an extra half hour to burn, and now I know where I can burn it. Sitting, waiting for you. No, that's not our typical reaction, is it? As the seconds, as the milliseconds tick by what do we think oh my goodness what are they doing what can be so important that they can't talk to me we struggle with impatience partly because this society is built on quickly accessing and getting what we want you ever text somebody and they didn't respond in 13 seconds I know they saw my text I know they have caller ID what are they doing? What could they possibly be doing that they can't text me back in four seconds, three seconds? Well, I'm going to text them again. Impatience. I'm not this morning going to talk about those type of responses, though we should learn patience in that particular regard. Life can slow down. It's okay. If you wait two minutes for french fries, count yourself blessed that you can afford french fries. If you have to wait a minute for a text response, it's okay. Praise God, you have the money to have a cell phone and, and friends to actually text. I feel like some people just text themselves because they don't have any friends who will text back to them. But I'm not, not, not going to deal with those type of patients. This morning, I want to specifically talk about when problems come and we jump ahead of the Lord. 
We get sometimes frustrated, perhaps even irritated along the way with those life situations. But if we're not careful, if we're not cautious, if we're not acting according to Scripture, we will treat God the same way. God, I prayed 13 seconds ago. Where's my response? God, I just ordered this through the drive through of prayer. Now I'm sitting at the window waiting for the delivery. Where are you at? Ever felt that way before? I have. I have. I felt that way. I, I have prayed and, and I have felt that God has delayed an answer outside of when I think it should be answered. It's like, Lord, here's my prayer request, here's a solution, and here's the timing. I've done it all for you, Lord. Just fill in the blanks. That's your power. God doesn't fill in those blanks. He doesn't fill in our blanks. God is working his own way. I want to look at this morning, because when I read this in 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Lord struck me with this concept of impatience in, with God. I see beginning in verse number 1, and look in, verse, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, where the Bible says, And Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. I see, first of all, that life had become a little bit comfortable for Saul. If you remember, we didn't look at it much, but if you'd read the story, remember this. When Saul was crowned king, they, they, they crowned him king and they cheered him on. They looked for Saul and they couldn't find him. He was scared. He was nervous. He was hiding in the baggage. Now, Saul was a head taller, the Bible tells us, than anyone else in the entire nation. If they were six foot, he would have been six, nine or seven foot tall. He was a handsome man, the Bible tells us. He was goodly to look upon. But Saul was humble, and in this case, he was a little bit afraid. But now, Saul has been king for a little bit of time. Saul has now grown to be a little bit comfortable. He has come into the kingship. He has begun to make some decisions. If you were to look back in chapter 12 and chapter 11 and 10, you'd see some situations that Saul had already handled, some conflicts that Saul had worked through, some situations with difficult people that Saul had had wisdom to handle. And now he's being king, but there's a little level of comfort going on here. Now Saul's starting to get this whole king thing down. But now a conflict comes and he orders 3,000 men to come. He had a good solution. He knew what to do. Before, back before, boy, he was almost living and praying off the seat of his pants. But now he's got a little bit of solutions figured out. You know, we got to be careful in our life when we start to get too comfortable with how we live. When we start to replace God with ourselves, and now when we handle life, now, Lord, it's all right, I've got this one. I'll call you when I need you. Lord, I see the bill, but I see over time, I, I'll take care of this problem. There's a little bit of comfort that I see in this passage that is the foundation for the, for the issue later on. Be careful when life becomes too comfortable, or you and I become too comfortable in life. When things start to go well, we start to get comfortable. We forget or we can forget how much we must depend upon God. Jesus said it this way, without me ye can do nothing. But we live as if Jesus said, without me you just can't do the hard things. We live as if Jesus said, listen, most things you can do, but pull me in on the big things. But Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Be careful when you get too comfortable in life, too comfortable even driving to work, too comfortable making decisions, too comfortable running your finances, too comfortable in your interpersonal relationships, too comfortable at work or at home. We want to depend upon God. There's a level of comfort there that Saul had. But in verse 2, when he chose 3,000 men of Israel, the Bible goes on to say, we're with, we're of, in verse number 2, we're with Saul and Michmash, and Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah and Benjamin, and the rest of the people, he sent every man to his tent. In verse number 5, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots. Now Saul had gathered 3,000 men, the Philistines here had gathered 30,000 chariots. 
They also had 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Avon. What happened was that now there was first there was comfort, but now there's a conflict. Saul had chosen 3,000 men. There's a thousand over here with Jonathan, sent some other people back. But the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, had shown up. There was a conflict. They had thousands of chariots, thousands of horsemen, and thousands of men, the Bible says, as the sand of the sea. Now, I've been to the beach before. My wife loves the ocean. I'm Puerto Rican, so I love the Caribbean. Bright blue water and that sand all over the place. I've never tried to count the sand. How would you begin? Where would you put it? Heard about a young boy who was on the shore at a beach and he was running to the beach and grabbing a, his little bucket full of water, running back to a hole and putting the water in the hole. An older gentleman was watching this young boy and, and he finally was, was overcome with curiosity. He said to the young boy, he said, what are you doing? And the young boy looked up with, with just complete normalcy and said, well, I'm emptying the ocean of water. The Bible says that the Philistines appeared to the Israelites as not having any number. Or if I could say it this way, the conflict was insurmountable. There are those times in our life when the conflict, when the trouble, when the tribulation, when the trial is so large that it seems to be insurmountable. Sometimes it comes from a doctor. And they say, well, it appears to be tell you what the diagnosis is. Seems insurmountable. Sometimes it's a telephone call from a child. Mom, I'm right here. The problem seems insurmountable. Sometimes it's the notice in the mailbox. The slip at work. The problem seems insurmountable. See, conflict will always come in our life. Until we go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, whether by the, by the resurrection or whether by death or whether by the second coming, whatever it may be, conflict will come in life. There, there are going to be some things that happen. I'm not, not trying to be a doomsday or negative. It's just the reality of life, is it not? Conflict's going to come. There will always be conflict in life. Conflict ought not to discourage us. It ought to strengthen us. The Bible says in James, the trying of our faith worketh patience and to straighten us. Sometimes conflict comes to get us back on the right path. Conflict ought to strengthen us. But conflict will come. How we respond in conflict is the key to pleasing God. And some conflict came and Saul, rightfully so, was afraid. Saul, rightfully so. I don't think anyone here this morning, no matter how much of a man you think you are, if you looked out and you saw the enemy and the soldiers were without number, plus the chariots and the horsemen, that you wouldn't say, oh boy, Houston, we've got a problem. There's some conflict there. Not only does conflict continue in verse number 6, and when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Not only was Saul at first comfortable, then there was some conflict, there was some concern. Now the people are running. All the men who were supposed to fight are now running away from the fight. So now Saul had some men before, but now he had nobody. Saul so had some support, it wasn't very much, but now they're hiding where? Anywhere they can possibly find. There's some concern. The Bible uses the word distressed. The people were distressed. There was a big fight going on. This was going to be a big battle, and the people thought, boy, you know what? There is no way that our puny army over here can defeat that vast, endless army. Paul was con or Saul was concerned for the altercation. Saul was concerned... For the abandoning. Verse number 8. He tarried seven days. According to the set time that Samuel had appointed. I wonder in your life and my life. What we do when we feel 
that we've been abandoned. There's Saul there, and he sees the army. He had some soldiers. They're out of there. There's a big altercation. There's a big fight coming, and now he's abandoned. He's been abandoned by his soldiers, but now Saul feels like he's been abandoned by God himself. Samuel had said, I'll be there in seven days. And so Saul is sitting there waiting for seven days. Seven days sounds like a short time, but I think that'd be a really long time to face down an enemy of that size, of that proportion. Seven days? Samuel, how would you make it seven seconds? Can I send a chariot to pick you up? I'll send my fastest chariot, my quickest horses. We'll be here. We'll take care of this. You see, there was a concern because Saul felt that God, and through Samuel, had abandoned him. He had instructed him to make these choices by faith and the sacrifice to put God first. But now, he's not showing up. You see, sometimes we feel in our life, Lord, I'm doing what you've asked me to do. I'm walking by faith, but you have not shown up yet. Lord, I'm I'm honoring you in my finances, but Lord, I feel like seven days have passed and you've not shown up yet. I can't see you yet. Lord, I feel like, like I'm walking by faith in my marriage, but you're not showing up yet. I can't see you yet. Lord, I'm, I'm walking by faith with my children, but you're not showing up. I'm walking by faith at my job, but Lord, it's been seven days and I can't see you work yet. What do you do when you feel abandoned? When you feel like on your end, you've done exactly what God has said to do. Saul is sitting there, and he's waiting. He's sitting there waiting for Samuel to show up, just like he was supposed to. It wasn't like Saul was out there playing hooky with the other boys. Saul wasn't going to fight yet. Saul was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. Lord, I'm seeking your your face I'm praying for wisdom Lord I'm following the options but Lord I just don't feel that you're showing up everything is still dark out you see when we think God hasn't shown up yet he may be just over the horizon what happens next is a choice that you and I must make. We are going to face conflict in our life. There will be times of concern. There will be situations that are way too big for us to handle. Nothing that we can do. There is nothing that Saul could do. He could not grab a sword and hope in any way, shape, or form to defeat the entire army. All he could do was wait on God. And there he is waiting. What if he's sitting there, day number seven, and he pops up? The day the day Samuel's going to come, and maybe it'll come with the first crack of light. Maybe Saul's up early. Look at him. I don't see him yet. Another hour? Another hour? Reminds me of that first time I went hunting in the woods looking for a deer. Every sound in the woods made me jump. I'm excited, I'm thrilled, I'm nervous for the first hour and for the second hour. But then I'm cold, I'm tired and cranky. And at some point in here, Saul switched from being nervous and anticipating Samuel to feeling that Samuel and really God had abandoned him. He got to a point where he's like, you know what? There is no solution except for me to do something. There is no option. I'm looking. I've been waiting for Samuel seven days now. I'm looking this way. I'm looking this way. And there's the problem right in front of me. And the only thing I can do is now make the sacrifice. And Saul made a choice. Saul made a choice. And my friend, I want you to notice something about this choice. Saul made a choice in a sense to ask for God's help. Saul, when he went to make this sacrifice, did not go and offer a sacrifice to another God. Saul did not say, well, that's it. You know what? God's not going to show up. I'll go to the false god, Baal. I'll go to this God back from, from, from Egypt. No, Saul still went to worship Jehovah. He just didn't go about it the way that God told him to go about it. Saul made a choice, and that choice was to go ahead 
and make the sacrifice that the, only the priest was supposed to make. Saul was the king, but Saul was not the priest. Saul had no business making a sacrifice. God had set up, Saul, you're the king, but my priest will sacrifice to me. And Saul said, you know what? He's not here. I've got to do this. And Saul made a choice in impatience to run ahead of God. Saul rightfully knew that God could solve this problem. He was just trying to hurry up the solution. God, you can do this. I'll just hurry you up. You see, he wasn't worshiping a false god. He was worshiping God in his own way. The big deal here, my friend, is the fact that there is only one person who can be a prophet, priest, and king. And his name is Jesus. The mistake that Saul made when he disobeyed the Lord that day was that he took the place and usurped the place reserved only for Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can rule and reign forever as perfect prophet, priest, and king. Saul didn't know all of those, perhaps, those details, but Saul did know that he wasn't supposed to do that. God doesn't maybe tell us everything, but he tells us enough. And our choice is either to obey or to disobey. It's really that simple. Either I follow God or I don't follow God. And Saul, all he had to do was wait a little bit longer because after the choice Saul made, he was caught. Look at the scripture, if you would, with me. Look here, verse number 10, or verse number 9, where Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me. And peace offering, he offered the burnt offering. Verse number 10, and it came to pass that as soon, as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. As soon as he got done, not a moment before and not a moment after, as soon as the offering was done, Samuel was there on the horizon. The Bible says that Saul went out to salute him. That word salute means to, in a, to, to give respect and honor. Really what Saul is doing, I, I believe from Scripture, is that Saul saying, Oh, great Samuel, you're here. This is tremendous. I'm so glad you're here. Saul was not he was not sad. He was not ashamed. He was going out to meet Samuel. Listen, we, we took care of this. Understand that Samuel wasn't late. Remember the scripture said that the Bible said, Samuel said, wait seven days. The seventh day was not over yet. Samuel wasn't late. He was right on time. He just didn't come soon enough for Saul. And my friend, in your life and in my life, and I can test to this fact, that God is never late. He doesn't always show up when I want him to, but I want him to show up in the first 13 seconds. Lord, I heard about the problem. I just heard about it, so solve it. And sometimes God says, listen, I'm going to have you wait seven days so you can learn to trust me for seven days. And if Saul had just waited the time he was supposed to, Samuel was, was gone his way. Samuel had obviously already left. Samuel was already walking that way. Samuel was traveling that way. And as soon as Saul got done, Samuel is there and Saul goes to, to show up and he's caught. And then I see in verse 13 and 14 the cost. Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. My friend, here's the point this morning. Here's the point. Three, three quick points or three quick notes about the point of this will be done. In our life, there's going to be conflict. In our life, there's going to be a choice we're going to have to make whether we follow God, whether we wait on God, or whether we rush ahead and try to solve it ourselves. Saul rushed ahead, and because of that, Samuel said, Listen, Saul, friend, you've done foolishly. You've done blown it. And you would have been king for a long time, and you would have reigned, your seed would have reigned forever, but now you can't because you rushed ahead because of your impatience. 
Saul, the choice you made cost you a whole lot more than a little battle. The choice you made cost you the legacy, cost you far beyond. The Bible says it this way in Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Remember this, that number one, impatient costs you more than you realize. Impatience towards God costs you more than you realize. Someone said it this way, like a fruit picked green or a flower plucked before it blossoms, our attempts to rush God's timing can spoil the beauty of his plan for our lives. And my friend, as you face problems in life, don't pick the flower early. Let God make that flower, grow that flower so it comes and it blossoms for his glory and for his honor. Understanding that there are times when doing nothing is better than doing anything. I love that Lamentations 3 verse 26. It is good that a man both hope and quietly wait. That's hard for men. Quietly wait. We can hope and we can try some solutions. We can do this. We can do this. We can, oh, that didn't work real well. The Bible says impatience costs us more than we realize. We learn to wait on God. His timing is perfect. perfect. His solutions are phenomenal. And he is always present. Number two, remember this. It's not if you will wait, but how long and how you will wait. There are going to be times, I, my friend, there are going to be times you will wait on God. You will wait on God. It's not if you will wait, but how and how long you will wait. I encourage you this morning, wait until God solves the problem. Wait until God shows up. It may feel like the 11th hour. It may feel like the seventh day. It may feel that God has forgotten, even that God has not kept his word. Saul felt that Samuel had not kept his word, but he had. He did, he was, and God always keeps his word. One thing is certain, before God moves suddenly, we will wait. Waiting is a fact of life. No one gets out of it. So it's not a question of if we will wait, but how we will wait. His timing is perfect. The purposes of God often develop slowly because the plans of God are never hurried. Great preacher one time was pacing like a caged lion, praying for a solution. And one of his friends came to him and said, what is wrong, sir? And he said, the trouble is that I'm in a hurry, but God's not. Learn to wait on God. His timing is perfect. You will wait on God. Waiting is not laziness. Waiting is the process of becoming what God wants us to be. This morning, I wonder if you have a problem. I wonder if you have an issue. I wonder if you have a conflict. And you've been praying. You've been seeking God's face. You've been asking. And God hasn't shown up yet. My friend, this morning, don't move yet. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is good that a man both hope and quietly wait on the Lord. You see, Saul, he rushed ahead. Saul, he knew where the solution was going to come from, God. But he decided just not to wait for God. But God will do what God does. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I know that there are problems we face in our heart. Our hearts are heavy. They're burdened. Lord, we get anxious. We get concerned. Lord, may we have the patience to wait on you. One, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Maybe there's a conflict in your life right now. Maybe there's some concern. And you've been praying, but you feel like God hasn't shown up yet. One, who would say this morning, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray that God would help me to quietly wait on God, to wait in, patient, in patience on God, not in impatience? I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? God spoke to me. Amen. I
see a hand. Who else? Amen, amen, amen. A few, yes. God bless you. Who else? Say, Pastor, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning that I would learn to wait on God? Boy, I'm struggling with that today. Pastor, I can identify with Saul. It feels like seven days have passed and God hasn't shown up yet. I didn't raise my hand before. I'll raise it now. God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me this morning? Who else would say, Pastor, I see that. I wonder if you're here this morning, my friend, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I wonder if you were to die today, if you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. And I'll draw no more attention to you than anyone else. But I'd love to also pray for you. I don't want you to leave the service this morning without someone opening a Bible. We'd love to open a Bible and show you what the Bible says about how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you this morning. You would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, more importantly, you know the hearts. Lord, you know the work that you want to do in our lives. Lord, many have indicated that this morning you touched a spot in their life where impatience has grown. Lord, I pray you'd give them the strength to respond in the right way to wait. Lord, and not just wait, but quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Lord, strengthen hearts and lives this morning. May we not rush ahead. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, this morning they'd allow us to open the Bible and show them from your word how they can know for sure they're going to heaven. Lord, bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.